Good morning, everyone. It's nine o'clock and I think we should get started. I would like to welcome you all to the second day of our SIA conference. It's a longer day and with more presentations than yesterday. Those of you who attended yesterday's sessions, I think you'll agree with me that uh, we had two very informative and at the same time thought-provoking keynote presentations. The first one was by Professor Ntabiseng Ogude on reimagining the link between basic and higher education for student success. A very, very important topic indeed for our purposes. And the second one by Professor Sean Harper, and it was on a critical race analysis of Blake undergraduate student success at an urban university. Also a very, very relevant topic for us here in South Africa. Today, we are going to start with um, two presentations from our partners, one from the Durban University of Technology and the other one from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. But before I call upon those presenters, I would just like to flag one slide from yesterday. Just give me a sec and I will share this slide. I hope we can all see that slide. I'll put it into slideshow mode. We, Jenny Glenny presented this slide yesterday in her introductory uh, speech, but she asked me to show it again this morning briefly because there was a slight error in the partner institutions. So you will notice there that we have the seven Siapumelela partner institutions. And there was a repetition of UWC and UFS was omitted. So I would like to let you know that those are the seven partner institutions for the Siapumelela network. But of course, we also have the participant institutions that uh, Jenny showed and one associate institution, making all of them 14 for the current network. So that's just the uh, correction we wanted to make and draw your attention to. I'll stop sharing that slide. So without wasting much time, I would like to call on DUT to make their presentation on nurturing student success at DUT through Envision 2030. You will have 20 minutes of um, presentation and then we will reserve the last 10 minutes or so for questions and answers. After DUT, we will have um, University of KwaZulu-Natal who will present on the automated student advising. So let me, without wasting much time, call upon uh, Professor Sibia to make her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, colleagues. Um, um, as, as indicated by the program director, I am Nogutula Sibia, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Teaching and Learning at DUT. And I am also the Siapumelela project leader at the university. And our presentation entitled Nurturing Student Success at DUT through Envision 2030 will showcase how Siapumelela is aligned to and embedded in our DUT strategic plan and vision 2030. The next slide, please. This second phase of the Siapumelela project at DUT addresses the four biggest uh, student success challenges we currently face through three focus area. First, financial and food insecurity. 
The majority of our students come from, from poor backgrounds. 65% of our students received NESFAS support last year. Food insecurity exists and is a serious concern for some students who are not eligible for NESFAS, such as our BTEC pipeline students. Also, many students are not financially literate. They don't know how to budget or to make good spending and saving decisions, thereby perpetuating financial insecurity. The second challenge is associated with disjointed university support systems and processes. There are many excellent initiatives implemented across the university to provide academic and non-academic support for our students. But these are often siloed and disjointed. The first two challenges are being addressed under focus area one of the project, namely holistic student support redesign, which integrates and coordinates the various support activities. We have rebranded this Sigusegele, we've got you. Our current and planned initiatives include a dedicated orientation for our differently abled students, uh, the, the Pagimpilo and One Resident, One Garden Projects aimed at alleviating food insecurity and the Vuna Leadership Academy amongst our many interventions. Our third major student success challenge relates to the different levels of preparedness of our students to become the creative, adaptive and entrepreneurial graduates envisioned um, in our strategic plan. Over half our students entering uh, students are first generation and come from lower quintile schools. Our male students are consistently underperforming. Our staff are also differently abled in terms of the skills and pedagogies needed to effectively guide and develop our students into adaptive graduates. A new dynamic is the shift to remote learning as a result of COVID-19 and the digital divide that most of our students and some staff experience in terms of data, connectivity, devices, and technical know-how. The middle students are those who are at risk of not completing even in extra time, and who are then at a very high risk of dropping out if they are not eligible for NESFAS. These challenges are being addressed through focus area two, moving the middle. Lastly, the fourth student success challenge relates to building an institution-wide culture of evidence-based decision-making. There are pockets of excellence in terms of using data effectively to inform, monitor, and evaluate. But through the Sepmelela project, we aim to achieve a lived evidence-based culture that is entrenched across the university. The next slide, please. Our DOT strategic plan known as Envision 2030 seeks ultimately to improve lives and livelihoods both within our DOT community and the broader society. And it is scaffolded on four perspectives, which are stewardship, systems and processes, sustainability, and society. Each perspective is founded upon three strategic objectives. Ladies and gentlemen, what you see is just one of the three strategic objectives for each perspective. Lived values, innovative curricula, distinctive education, and adaptive graduates. The next slide, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a video presentation that we'd like to share with you. Our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Tangram Tembu, will introduce our DOT values and principles. He will be followed by our health and wellness team, who will share how they live the DOT values of as they provide support to our students during the remote teaching and learning. Thereafter, our student development coordinator and students will share how DOT is co-creating our teaching and learning space with students as the stewards of their own success. We close with one of our staff development leaders who will briefly speak about the resomatic approach we are using to embed a student success culture in our ways of thinking and doing at DOT. Thank you and enjoy the video. Could you kindly show the video for us?
Um, I'm not sure if uh, it's me alone. I don't seem to have the volume. Yes, uh, we, we don't have the volume. If ever we could um, have that correct, sir. thank you. Apologies, if you just give me one second to try and uh, fix that. Thank you. Our DNA is not just words on a page, but it portends a deep and a shared understanding and enactment of the values and principles of namely transparency, honesty, integrity, respect, accountability, and the trace of fairness, professionalism, commitment, compassion, and excellence in our engagements with others, in our decision making, in our systems and processes and policies. Our institutional DNA is what lies at the very deepest level of our being. It is a code that lies at the very heart of what defines us as a unique institution and a unique collective of people that are part of it. It informs the way we are and the way we influence and respond to our environment. Wellness unit consists of a multiple professional team of psychologists, nurses, intense social workers and administrative staff from both the Midlands and Durban Pharmacy. I'm Sufem Banjo, Kenneth and I are psychologists, and we will share how our team are supporting our students during COVID-19. Our presentation highlights the stewardship perspective of Envision 2030 and the values and principles of compassion, commitment, professionalism, and accountability to mention but a few. Student Wellness Department and the Student Support Services Division at DUT aims to nature a people-centered culture that embodies the lived values and principles to ensure students are supported holistically and excel academically. Our presentation reflects on how the Wellness Center has transitioned in its approach to reach out to students by adopting virtual platforms as part of our initiatives to render student support and care particularly during COVID-19, which leaves many of our students with high levels of loneliness, anxiety, stress, and uncertainty. Use of online platforms like MS Teams, Doximi, has opened new avenues for reaching students. It also saves students time and financial costs of traveling to the wellness center. Our staff, as part of the transition, as needed to adapt and abandon their own comfort zones. For example, the normal contact therapy has transitioned to online counseling, the reality of the current time. The key elements to our approach in the Wellness Center is driven by student needs. As staff, we research the area and conceptualize the possible approaches and frameworks before implementing our programs. The programs are informed by the theory and data we gather from our students. We use data to monitor and evaluate programs and services for quality and relevance. This presentation discusses three initiatives which we are implementing, namely individual online therapy, Thrive Online Anxiety Support Group, and Parking Pillow, our food insecurity program. I will now hand over to Candice to tell you more the data reports developments up to November 2020. Many of our DUT students are experiencing high levels of anxiety, mood-related disorders, and interpersonal difficulties. It was thus important to ensure that continuation of services and other students' psychosocial and emotional support during the COVID pandemic. Students also presented with financial concerns, specifically in relation to not having food. Confidential online counseling in line with the HPCSA regulation was provided to DUT students living the Envision 2030 values of commitment and professionalism. 
Our staff are modeling the adaptive graduates' strategic objectives as we, as we pivot to online platforms to continue providing support. Protocols were developed to ensure fairness and online forms devised, which increased the efficacy of resource utilization and decreased environmental risk. Despite resource challenges around laptops and data, et cetera, Student Counseling was the first unit within DET and South Africa to offer individual online counseling services to students. Anxiety appeared to be one of the most common psychiatric disorders reflected in the 2020 stats. Therefore, an online anxiety support group for drivers initiated. Facilitation manuals were developed for staff and students. The groups were then advertised online and started Um, we have lost voice once again. Hello, Craig. There is no sound. Uh, I'm trying to fix it for a second because I was still receiving sound on my side. Okay, thank you. Are you still not receiving any sound? No. No, I... no, we don't, Craig. Okay, um, I'm going to leave myself unmuted then, and hopefully we are going to receive the sound better uh, through that way. Um, so if you would just let me try it again one more time. However, students reported the data costs were a significant reason for, for withdrawing from, from attendance, along with conflicts with academic activity or preference for individual counseling. Students have requested online support for depression, grief and loss, and substance abuse. Our computer was launched in October 2020 during lockdown. This was to provide a service to students even during the COVID-19 pandemic. Screening was done online by the social workers from counselling. A total of 123 applications were received. 119 vouchers were allocated. Within these allocations, our students receiving vouchers for their second month. Pakampilo provides interim relief of two months, given that the programme relies on donations and the demand outweighs the funds available. More females and males have benefited from the programme. Regarding UF study, 17 applicants were first year and 76 applicants second, third, and BTEC. Mostly BTEC students applied for this program. The reason for this BTEC students do not receive NSFAS funding. We have always to learn change and adapt to a new way of life. The Wellness Center embraces these changes as we seek to improve the live experiences of our students in the spirit of Envision 2030. Good day, everyone. My name is Mzwandi Kumalo, and I'm the coordinator for the Student Support and Development Unit at the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching. And I'm going to be talking a little bit on the students as collaborators in creating meaningful campus experiences and also their own contribution towards success. And of course, literature tells us that uh, when students are actually involved, then they are interactive with the peers, staff, activities and other resources within the university. This actually enhance their lived experiences, academic performance, and also their own support. And the COVID-19 pandemic really has pivoted a pedagogical, a pedagogical transformation, which of course then puts students at the center of transforming the learning processes and the impact therein. In the context of the Devon University of Technology, 
we have since updated and revised our strategic direction. And this actually has a noticeable factor in ensuring that each and every stakeholder or key role players within the DT ecosystem plays their role, inclusive of students as collaborators in the achievement of Envision 2030. And this, of course, has allowed us to do a number of activities in working collaboratively with students and identifying enablers and inhibitors to their own success, but then also in the curation of the student support initiatives under the notion of nothing for us without us. I have two of my students here that I have been working with throughout the year. Uh, Miriam Kotzer, who is a first year student in information technology, and she is also rather a winner of the orientation grand prize. And I also have Amaja Shami, who is a, a master's student in business administration, an orientation helper, and also a tutor mentor advisor under the first year student experience program and also the resident educational program since 2019. I'd like to start with Miriam. Uh, just give us a little bit of a reflection of how the year has been for you and what sort of academic support have you received in ensuring that you have a successful 2021 academic year. Miriam? Okay, so it was difficult to imagine what the transition from high school to university would actually be like until I experienced it. After listening to countless teachers telling me that from the moment you hit university, the pressure would be on immediately, it prepared me for a daunting and intimidating experience. But to my utmost relief, this was not the case. From the get-go, things have been smooth sailing, and I would say the majority of the credit goes to the orientation process. It provided in-depth detail on many aspects such as campus structure, uh, the different departments housed on them, and the different services provided to us as students. And the best thing about this whole process was that every day we were presented with the opportunity to ask questions on the topics discussed, which eased the pressure and helped for us to be more confident in our transition. Listening to fellow peers' questions also helped us because it made us aware that we were not going through this alone and that our questions were not trivial. And I believe the post-orientation activities were also uh, instrumental to our success for transition because when certain concerns were brought up by students that could not be addressed immediately, uh, we were provided with the opportunity to talk to these specific departments on different days in order to help address our concerns. And these range from the use, to, uh, the use of online learning platforms and um, the different uh, services provided to us and uh, issues regarding registration. Personally, I believe that I benefited from these sessions because they helped us speak about our concerns freely. And not only were we getting help from the staff and members of the university, but we were also getting help from students who took the initiative to help others. Uh, my group chats were filled with students helping each other, and we made and this made our transition easier. From the sending of links to being the very voice of the students who could not participate in the process, uh, this created the essence of a community as we all came together to support one another. And learning about the different support services, not that I never did I imagine that I would actually use one of them. But when I came to a research assignment that I had to do, I sought the help of the DUT Writing Center. They provided me with a tutor who helped address my concerns and helped provide written feedback on what I had to do. And this was extremely valuable, and I believe I will definitely use the service in the future because it provided me confidence in my assignment. And so surviving my first semester has been easier than I thought, especially considering that everything we need to know has been taught to us from the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Amat, on your side, I, I want you to reflect on a little bit uh, the, the transition from contacts to online learning, but then also your role as uh, a student in using the peer-to-peer -peer approach in uh, supporting other students, but then also you know, the campus culture, which is one of the strategic uh, initiatives that we really are focusing on for the year. Uh, Amata, over to you. Good morning, everyone. In the understanding of COVID-19, uh, South Africa at large 
have been forced to transit from face-to-face -to, -face to online learning, of which that has resulted not in a good way for disadvantaged students. But uh, in particular, for DUT, uh, speaking on behalf of DUT, DUT has done a great and has implemented a great strategy in terms of providing data to students and also giving, observing COVID rules, uh, giving access to students uh, for them to access computers at the library. Because this has actually hindered uh, disadvantaged students from realizing their full potential of, of online learning. But since DLT has been able to assist them in terms of providing data and also providing them with many tutors in terms of WhatsApp uh, groups and whereby they are being updated on a daily basis, how to use this online has actually brought a sense of belonging to those students and also has gave them a sense of being part of DLT community, of which that also helps in uh, fostering the, uh, the university culture at large because we have programs like FYSC, which uh, focuses on best year students' experience, getting to know your university. And also we have REP, which is a program that promotes academics at a residence level within the institution. This alone promotes and fosters the, 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 the university culture and the, the values, accountability, academic freedom to students. And it's a great initiative that DUT has done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shania. And, and of course, colleagues, some of the reflections that we have got from students in terms of the number of initiatives that we do, uh, one being a letter to my grade 12 self, where students are actually comparing their expectations when they were in grade 12 and how the expectations have changed now uh, as they are in the university. But then also at the center of the curation, of the holistic student support to the Segele we've got you, uh, students have actually played a very important role uh, in the design and curation of these uh, programs. Uh, staff as well, as you can see on the pictures, but then yep, also in good. a number of projects that we have introduced, right, well, here, such as Moving the Middle and also the yeah. Villa Leadership Academy, students have been at the center and we've made sure that their our voices are actually uh, heard and they actually are taken into account. Thank you very much. Yes, you have only three minutes left. If you could wind up and maybe entertain one question if there is any. I don't see. I needed to have informed people that you are free to post your questions in the question and answer box. And there are there's four minutes left in this video. Okay. Oh. Okay, um, let's see how we can go. I'm Elini Chitanan, representing the Moving the Middle Project of Sia Pumalela 2.0. I will be speaking briefly on embedding student success at DUT, a rhizomatic approach. We draw on the figuration of the rhizome from Jalous and Gutari as an overarching approach and philosophy for the Sia Pumalela project at the Durban University of Technology. Unlike the tree, which is arborescent, linear, and hierarchical, the rhizome as an underground root plant develops horizontally, growing continuously with numerous eruptions or nodes, creating new lines of flight or life. Each node is connected to every other part of the rhizome in a web-like fashion. The rhizome thus signifies multiplicities and interconnectedness in the same way as envision 2030's four perspectives and 12 strategic objectives. The assemblage, a key concept of the rhizome, becomes our point of reference and consists of all human and non-human entities. The latter consisting of our structural arrangements, like strategies, policies, and guidelines, institutional mission and vision, our ethos, culture, beliefs, and values. The human entities, of course, are our staff, our students, and our broader community. 
In thinking with and through the Rasanatic philosophy, we explore the interconnectedness and entanglements of the multiple entities of the Sia Pumalela assemblage within the full campus ecosystem and those partnerships external to the university as we engage in Sia Pumalela 2.0. This relational ethos is linked to the African philosophical approach of Ubuntu, embodying humanness, community, and coexistence, and which is embedded within our work, reflecting co-creation, co-belonging, partnerships, and care. And you have already seen and heard these in our two preceding presentations. Student success initiatives at the DUT work in unison, continuously in motion, making great strides to break silos, working collaboratively and integratively with all entities that are part of the DUT Sia Pomalela assemblage, all mutually co-constituting each other. Drawing on the rhizomatic philosophy of becoming, student success remains in becoming. That means it is not a finished product, a once-off event, or even a journey that may imply that one arrives. Rather, student success is a relational, dynamic, continuous, evolving, iterative process of knowing, doing, transforming. And this requires that we are adaptable, constantly questioning, re-envisioning, and innovating our curricula and thinking creatively as global citizens towards improving lives and livelihoods and contributing to the flourishing of humanity and our planet. And these are underpinned by all our lived values of Envision 2030. Thank you very much, DUT, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I don't think we will have any time for you to answer questions, and I don't seem to see any as well in the question and answer box. So for the next presentation, it does look like we might not have time for people to ask questions at the end. So any questions that you have, please make sure that you post them in the question and answer space and we will we will look at them and we can draw uh, the presenter's attention to those questions at the end if there is time so without wasting much time let me call upon university of kwazulu natal to make their presentation let me also uh, inform you that these sessions are being recorded and will be available to participants Sorry, Ravi, I think you're on mute there. Oh, yes. My apologies, colleagues. I was on mute. I'm back. Can you hear me, Randil? Yes, we can now. My, my sincere apologies for that. Uh, I, I, I was saying I, I'm uh, Ravi Danpath, the um, Director of Teaching and Learning at UKZN. Mm -hmm and the institutional lead on the CA Pumalela project. And I was reflecting on uh, Jenny's comments yesterday, uh, where she noted that the mental health of our students is becoming a very serious social justice concern. 
And this is particularly true in South Africa where uh, participation in higher education is increasing. And so too does the need for academic advising, the cost of which is becoming increasingly unaffordable to many universities. And we, we, we know that the need to professionalize student advising is particularly dire uh, in a country such as South Africa, where the articulation gap between schooling and university is wide, necessitating a proactive systemic approach to integrating advising into the curriculum as opposed to having it as a reactive intervention. Now, we hear this perennial complaint that uh, there's a disjuncture between those who actually need advising services and those who actually utilize these services. And this can be attributed to multiple factors across several contexts, including race, class, ethnicity, amongst others. In the South African context, advising is becoming gendered. What do I mean by that? More and more female students now provide advising services to more and more male students. Now this has implications for the help seeking behavior of male students. And we know from available research that in patriarchal communities, boys are less likely to concede their need for support and advice and are even less likely to seek this from girls. So this clearly has implications for how we construct, in the first instance, uh, advising and signals the need for some form of proactive automated advising. And, you know, yesterday, Bill asked the question in his opening, uh, whether universities are student ready? Well, apparently not. While students are, are becoming increasingly digital, student advising is still analog. And this calls for alternative approaches, especially to accommodate students at risk. Can we anticipate a proactive system which ushers students to automated advising as their first port of call to address the many routine blank spots in higher education, such as you know, answering standard admission questions, course selection, timetabling, exam proctoring, and obtaining information on available facilities. These can be easily accommodated in an automated facility. However, for the more complex psychosocial and mental advising needs, the advising platform needs to use artificial intelligence to quickly scan the student's profile and redirect the student to a selected warm body advisor. So in general, higher education's digital transformation is now creating pristine opportunities for, for automated student support. And it's time we consider how to design these, these automated systems in principled, responsible ways. Can we envision a time when students have access to real-time access to information on the academic progression and real-time support in their pockets, in their smartphones? Well, I hand you over now to Randil, who will share some thoughts and cautions about this. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ravi. Um, so you can see on this title slide, uh, we'll talk a bit about the case for automated advising as well as for student advising in general. Then looking at uh, some of the experiences that I've had in working with uh, uh, different universities around the country in terms of implementing uh, automated advising and, and uh, as Ravi mentioned, some of the concerns that arise there then looking at some of the guiding principles that come out of those anecdotes and, uh, and some ways to ameliorate some of the challenges associated with those. And, and then of course, uh, to get how we can all participate in this kind of activity. 
So in terms of the case for student advising, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, the institutions that have engaged well with the student advising, whether automated or otherwise, are showing significant improvements. And we are seeing something like 50 to 100% improvements in graduation rates and so on. And that may come over a long space of time, but the results are quite clear. And uh, we can easily point to Georgia State in the US, but also locally at the UFS, um, we recently had a presentation by Branchwa who showed uh, very strong improvements uh, uh, due to their student advising. Um, one of the principles we discussed at that uh, meeting was that student advising is not that easily integrated into staff academic uh, workload. Uh, so of course, we know in South Africa, we have the high student staff ratio. Um, there's uh, quite a lot of training required for uh, the level of advising required in this approach. And uh, sometimes uh, the, the question of, of staff suitability for, uh, for this uh, nature of work. So to do student ad advising well, um, often meant uh, a significant commitment to staffing uh, uh, for advising. Um, and of course, this comes at, uh, at certain costs, but of course, uh, I believe a, a cost benefit analysis especially when you start factoring in the subsidy increase and so on, that would show it's quite worthwhile. Um, of course, then if you implement automated advising, uh, that further goes to uh, the, uh, the ease with which you can implement uh, advising and um, at a reduced cost. Um, but there are several factors that one needs to be aware of when undertaking automated advising. And as I've mentioned, I have a number of anecdotes to share about the experiences uh, in, in this area. Um, and then we'll come back and generalize that in terms of some principles uh, to take account of when engaging, uh, when engaging with automated advising. So one of the first things that emerged uh, to me, which was quite a surprise, was um, how significant the design of uh, the interface is in terms of the impact it will make on the student and indeed on the staff. So here's an example where we implemented accreditation reporting. And uh, there, uh, as you see in the screenshot, it simply informs the student about whether or not they've achieved a certain outcome according to the accreditation principles for that academic program. And it also shows the evidence there. And in fact, this interface was added just as an afterthought. It, it wasn't trying to do the actual accreditation reporting, which was a separate, more summative interface. Uh, so this was just added as an, uh, as an afterthought. And yet, uh, even students who knew all this before, so students had been uh, advised about all this and they had all this data, of course, they know their academic records. And yet suddenly students were banging on the door um, well, this is like this for this reason and, and all these kinds of explanations and suddenly a great deal more engagement only after this interface was in place. And it took me quite some time to understand why this was. Um, we also, for the first time, started getting compliments from the accrediting body that, wow, your students really seem to know your accreditation criteria. And I believe that's because suddenly when you have uh, not just the accreditation criterion, but your assessment against that, you very quickly learn what all the accreditation criteria mean. Um, and so it, it took a long time to reflect on why the influence was so strong. And part of the thinking is that uh, because the, um, the advising is quite specific and personalized, and in this particular interface, even with the student's um, headshot integrated, um, it, it becomes more vivid. Um, also, with that subtle use of colors or not so subtle use, um, there is some kind of implication of an opinion about your status. So it's no longer just a, a static view of your results and a kind of a sanitized look at where you currently are. Suddenly, there's a kind of uh, evaluation and, and the implication of an opinion there. So the interface design uh, can powerfully drive your behavior. The second thing that we noticed was uh, that, of course, you have to get your script right. So we showed a kind of subtle opinion giving just uh, in terms of colors. But when you, uh, when you generate advice, 
So it's possible to directly create natural language advising to students. And when you do that, you have to pay special attention to getting that script right. And on the right here, you can see what I would say is a, a bad example. It, it's something I, I put together partially as a joke and partially in the hope that there would be some uptake of this. And this is an interface, especially around the fees must fall time when uh, I was feeling that students also need to have some appreciation of the costs involved in higher education. And so on this interface, it's showing a student, here's the amount of time you are taking to complete. And these are the courses where uh, you haven't passed on the first time, you've taken extra time to complete. And it says there, your study is subsidized by the government. By taking this extra time to complete, you've cost the state and the university this extra uh, money. Um, and then it also tries to estimate, and, and that's very conservative, uh, an estimated loss of earnings and so on. So uh, it, it's all accurate. This is a real um, uh, case study, um, but uh, this was never approved for implementation. Uh, uh, perhaps I should say, uh, of course not. And um, that's uh, because there are a number of issues with this. Um, so it's, it's quite a judgmental uh, interface. It's, uh, it's telling students, um, you, you bad student, this is what you're doing to the whole government now. Um, and also the, the very summative comment at the end, please avoid further losses by passing all your courses. I mean, uh, that, that's a very broad intention. It's not giving you a specific action to take. And we'll talk a bit later about um, what you should be advising instead. Um, so part of the approach to improving uh, an interface like this would be to make it possible for the staff involved in teaching this uh, to have access to the system and, and for it to be possible to customize the advising scripts. And, and sometimes it's the case that um, encoded into the system are not all the possibilities uh, of support at the institution. And there may be other classifications of students. So some students um, are on special categories where they, uh, where they are already on a program of additional support and, and so on. So engagement with the system is important to do. It's necessary to be able to customize the advising that's uh, being provided to the system. So that's something that I really appreciated that any system that's implemented has to be really open to other people uh, being able to get in and, uh, and revise things and, and improve on uh, the type of advising uh, it, it delivers. Um, another thing that I noticed was that, that staff uh, would sometimes use the system for an easy justification. So for example, when students approach us about uh, concessions for registering for courses that they don't yet have the prerequisites in place for, then if the system is generating the advice, and you can see on the left here that the system can show you for all the future uh, semesters, I anticipate you, you can register for this, but not for this, and it gives the reasons. So uh, that, that's all good and, and it gives the right information and, and it's showing it in natural language and, and all of that. But still, we have to be wary of using this as a justification not to engage because sometimes it is possible for there to be a good education outcome if we consider breaks in the rule. So part of my concern about automated advising is that it becomes much easier for those of us making the decisions uh, to say, no, the system says you can't do this and that's why you can't do it. And, and that's no reason at all. We should be looking at evolving our rules all the time. And uh, maybe to, uh, to catch up with time a bit more, um, this also shows that. Um, so uh, this, this was a case where um, we had, at, so this is at one of my previous institutions where we had a two day exercise where we debated each student's case um, for, uh, this was after the, the, the exams and where we were looking at the student's trajectory. It would normally be a two day exercise where we look at each student's status and the situation and look at trying to estimate whether or not uh, we should consider uh, changes in rules and whether our rules were still up to date. And that was a really good engagement. And then um, 
in in my role at that time, uh, I was the I was the kind of uh, academic program manager, and and that was around the time I started writing the Auto Scholar, and that's uh, when the Auto Scholar generated this advice, and um, and I just had that advising uh, on the side, just intended to supplement the discussion, and then very quickly the staff latched on to that it was giving the correct advice, and after about the first ten minutes. Um, that quote there, Randy, you don't worry about those green ones, just skip to the reds. Let's not discuss every student now. And so that is very quickly something that happens that staff take the advising given by a system as the final word. And you see here, it is showing very high accuracies. And yes, it, it did work correctly. It did give the correct advice. But there are sometimes missed opportunities to evolve our rules and understand our students better. Because especially for myself as a new person at a new institution, understanding the soft rules that are in place and that sometimes the soft rules become the hard rules because as we try out uh, a, a granting of concessions and then looking at whether those concessions turn out to, to be good ones and, uh, and then evolving the rules, Sometimes we can miss out on the opportunity to evolve our rules and enhance our programs and even curricula. Uh, there's sometimes a missed opportunity when we have an automated system that's uh, dispensing your rules very clearly. Um, one of the other concerns, uh, this was from uh, some of the staff, um, that it makes it much easier to apply for concession. So won't we get many more applicants to the system? And in fact, I believe that's something that we should promote and encourage that uh, we want people probing the rules all the time and, and trying um, to do what they believe is good for them academically. Of course, we know that uh, people uh, sometimes are just trying to jump, jump the barriers rather than uh, doing uh, the best thing academically. Um, but still, there's a question about choice and, and uh, for whom the choice should be. Um, there is also a tension between being supportive. So if we know that, they, uh, that there are academic issues and that there is risk uh, in, uh, in a certain decision, then it, it is important to inform people about this. But at the same time, we don't want to discourage people from trying things and from putting in the extra effort needed to succeed. Um, so again, it's important to be able to participate in this. It's important to, to understand when the automated advising um, is, uh, is giving advice that's based on rules that are open to change. So we must still participate in reviewing our advising criteria. We must still be able to edit those criteria as needed as we are trying new things and evolving our programs. Um, another important aspect of advising is not so much the direct advising from either a system or from a, a human advisor communicating to a student. Sometimes the advising takes the form of, um, of an interface, uh, like we saw earlier, which is deliberately gamified. So if you like the example earlier was a kind of accidental gamification. But today, the principle of gamification is, is quite widespread. And uh, if I think about my own son, um, he, uh, he's on this reading program and uh, he's doing quite well in it. And, and he's, uh, he's quite high up on a list of, of people who are reading uh, uh, many, many books. And then uh, suddenly there was this other person from, uh, from Centurion in Gauteng also uh, uh, starting to challenge his top position. And, and it was quite interesting at the breakfast table each morning, uh, we, we would all be uh, interested in, in knowing how this, uh, this unnamed uh, uh, girl in, in Centurion, how many books she'd uh, read the previous night. So um, the, the, the point of all this is um, that these leaderboards and points and badges they can gamify the educational experience and it can harness the competitiveness in people to, uh, for, for good academic outcomes. And the example I gave uh, is about my eight-year-old son, but uh, even we uh, as adults are, are 
are also living in this gamified world. So if you think about your, your points, uh, when you make purchases for even groceries or uh, on Facebook, the number of uh, friends you have and, and so on. So we are living in this gamified world. We are already being influenced by the principles of, of gamification as it's called. Um, and, and we can adapt this energy. We can harness it for education. But if you don't do this very carefully, if you implement this carelessly, you can actually demotivate people. So um, I gave the example of, of my son and, and him competing with uh, another student, but you can imagine the situation if you're very far down the leaderboard and you may well throw up your hands and say, well, uh, what's the point? I'm, I'm so far, far down that uh, it seems I should just resign from this. So it's important to design these, uh, these things that we think are incentivizing uh, the education energy. Um, we, we have to be careful that we are not uh, having the reverse impact there. So as it says in, in the first point, human motivation is a very complex thing. Um, almost most of the time, I would say, it, uh, the outcomes are quite counterintuitive. Um, so that's that's one aspect of its complexity the other thing is that motivation is often very specific to the individual user so each user uh, may be more responsive to uh, to his or her own motivation model and in some systems it's baked into the process that you can figure out what the motivation model is for a particular individual and and use it for that individual but then you, you must know to do that and, and implement it in that way. So some cautions there on gamification. And then in terms of uh, some of the unintended consequences that we have as well, um, sometimes uh, we, we have uh, what I call rich people problems down there. So um, we had a case uh, where uh, the Orchard Scholar was able to figure out that an alternate course uh, was possible for uh, progressing students. So in terms of determining uh, students' progression and trying to stay on minimum time to graduate, um, the, uh, in a particular case, the Auto Scholar uh, found that there was a course that was equivalent um, to the course that students uh, normally registered through, um, but it was timetabled differently. So suddenly it had identified this course, which, um, which made it possible to graduate in minimum time. And even though uh, that, that was in place for years and years, suddenly uh, the awareness was on this course and all the students uh, were being advised by the system to register for it. And so they all went ahead and registered. And then we got these phone calls from the maths department. Uh, why are so many students now registering for this course? We normally have just 10 students in this course. Um, so that was a case where it, it, it did work well. We had a higher graduation rate in minimum time because of that, but that also uh, required significant timetabling and venue changes. And, and so sometimes for good reasons, um, we have to be aware that there, there may be logistic consequences to our advising. And as I say there, that's a nice problem to have, right? We do want uh, students graduating. We, we want the nice problem of, uh, of having to figure out how to accommodate so many students passing through the system. So uh, rich people problems, uh, we want those, of course. Um, Just so a few moving, minutes, Randy, for you to round up. Thanks. Um, so here uh, then I'm just showing uh, the, uh, the, the principles that, that can be extracted towards it. And uh, I'll just give a quick summary on each one. So uh, the advising must be specific and actionable. So we, must, uh, we shouldn't give a, a broad statement like uh, try and pass all your courses. It must be, it seems you have this kind of issue. Uh, would you like to try uh, approaching this type of support? Um, it's also something that happens incrementally over time. So it's not about rebooting the system and creating a grand new plan. A lot of these changes happen over something like a decade. Um, so it, it's about boiling the frog, making these slow incremental changes that slowly get you to uh, the stage of, uh, of improved operations. 
And then uh, there is a lot of training available now. Uh, Ashton and I recently gave a, a session on machine learning where some of the comments were, uh, I, I can do machine learning now without having to write code. So uh, there, there is a great deal of training available. Um, there is also uh, uh, a, a series of engagements that we are proposing uh, where you'll be able to access methods and use the methods and engage. And we are also looking for the engagement that helps advise us in terms of uh, how we develop the system so it does stay effective. Um, and of course, to support the other emerging methods. Uh, thanks very much uh, for listening. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ruby and, and Randy. Um, I see there's one question in the Q&A space, uh, Fatima. Uh, if Ryan, it's from Jenny. Uh, has DUT used this automated advising, she asks? Anybody you from can... DUT? DUT colleagues? You can respond, DUT colleagues. Has DUT used this automated advising? Is the question. Randy, Ruby. Um, yeah, I, I can talk to that. Uh, at DUT, uh, the Auto Scholar is implemented, and uh, Ashton has been giving some uh, very good. Uh, uh, training sessions there. So a number of staff are using it. And uh, Ashton has mentioned to me uh, about a couple of the unintended uh, uses of it uh, in a positive way that um, he, he has reported on uh, new ways of using the system for identifying at risk in particular. Um, and in fact, he presented a bit on the methods that uh, they evolved uh, at, at that workshop I mentioned. Oh. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have to bring this session to an end so that people can be ready for the next um, presentations. So this brings us to the end of the two partner presentations for this morning. We are going to have a short break and then go into concurrent sessions that will start at exactly 10 past 10. And these will run from 10 past 10 up to 11.40. You will see from the program that there are four of them, concurrent session one, up to concurrent, up to concurrent session four. You are free to move from one session to another. You have the links, you just move on and click on the link for the appropriate session and you will join that session. So after these concurrent sessions at 10.40, we will adjourn and then reconvene at 1,500 hours for more presentations. So thank you very much for to the two uh, institutions, DUT and UKZN, for the 